Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to this special public live stream. We're going to be talking about Ledger Recover and this new service that they announced has created quite a bit of uh, controversy in the community. Now, um, there may be a, a guest on this uh, live stream. I uh, don't know if he'll be able to make it, but uh, if he does, we'll just pull him into the meeting and uh, get him on. Um, Jameson Lop may be joining us. We'll see how it goes. Uh, let me know in the chat if you can hear and see me well, if everything's okay on your end. Uh, give us a little wave in the chat, that would be great. There's a slight delay between the video and uh, the live. So, oh yeah, there we go, about five seconds. So um, I will uh, keep an eye on the chat just in case there's any uh, questions or follow-ups or things like that. And um, otherwise we'll get started here in just a second. I hope you're all having a wonderful weekend. And we're talking about uh, Ledger's new service called Recover. Now, this came to my attention primarily because uh, all of my public channels just flooded with messages. Oh my God, what is happening? Tell us more, um, figure this out. And so um, I wanted to give you some of my opinions. Oh, and there is Jameson. One second, let's see. All right, let's see. Jameson, hello. You're currently- Hello. We are live and streaming, welcome. Welcome uh, and hello from uh, Bitcoin Miami. Oh, fantastic, must be, uh, I'm guessing it's hot and humid there at the moment. Yeah, we've got plenty of air conditioning though. Oh, very good. It's It's been a while since we last spoke. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to jump on, on on short notice. And I think the last time we did a live together, it was... Ledger. The last time Ledger <laughs> had an oopsie. Um, mm -hmm. Now, for, for those of you who don't know about that previous occasion, uh, you can find it on my channel. It was a great uh, conversation with two other friends, uh, with Taylor Monahan and Peter McCormick, and of course, Jameson Lopp. And uh, we talked about Ledger's leak of their customer database from their website, which created uh, quite a bit of, uh, let's say backlash as well as quite a few problems. Um, James, Jameson, can I um, ask you to just introduce yourself uh, for the audience who don't know you? Yeah, I'm Jameson Lopp. I am the co-founder and CTO of CASA. We're a self-custody solution, and I've basically spent the past eight years building uh, self-custody solutions. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, one of the reasons you were one of the first people that came to mind um, to me when, when I wanted to talk about this is uh, there are probably only a handful of uh, true information security and operational security experts uh, in our industry who are comfortable about talking about these things publicly and sharing their risk analysis and their thoughts on things like this. Um, I, I hopefully I, I count myself as one of them and uh, uh, you you were the first person who came to mind so I'm, I'm very glad you were able to, to join. All right, so um, let's get started. Let me let me give a, a bit of uh, background. So Ledger uh, launched or announced a new service called Recover. And what this service is, is a service that allows you to uh, essentially share um, three fragments of your seed before the seed is actually produced uh, through your Ledger device. And those three fragments are then uh, sent to three providers. Ledger is one of them. And um, if in the future you lose your seed, you lose access to your seed or something happens, 
you can identify yourself and have them recover your seed by assembling two of those three fragments. So effectively, your, your seed is, is split into three pieces, and uh, any two of those pieces are sufficient uh, to reconstruct the seed. This was announced with really not a lot of fanfare, and the initial announcements didn't have a lot of detail. Uh, and as a result, it created a bit of a uh, crazed response from the community, a panicked response from the community. What are you doing to my devices? <laughs> and um, just uh, maybe this morning, uh, Ledger published a much more detailed article and FAQ and clarified many of those uh, details. Jameson, when did you first hear about this? What was your first impression? Yeah, uh, I heard about it uh, pretty much immediately, you know, because we had a bunch of clients calling in saying, oh, do I need to, you know, swap out my Ledger for some other <laughs> hardware manufacturer? And, uh, you know, and the short version was no, but, um, you know, that's because we put people into a, a multi, multi-key, multi-vendor setup. So the, the whole idea is, like, we understand there is no perfect hardware device on the market. Uh, the, right. you know, the, the way that you get around these weaknesses is by ensuring that uh, any one weakness is not going to you know, create a catastrophic loss for you. Now, I, I understood where Ledger is coming from. And, and by that, I mean that if you are a sophisticated enough user that you are purchasing and, and storing your keys on a dedicated hardware device, you know, you're probably already in the top 1%, like in terms of your security model. So you know, why would Ledger offer something like this? Well, for any of us who have worked in the custody space uh, for even just a few years, it becomes very apparent that like the next most likely way for you to screw up and lose your money if you're already, you know, you have your keys uh, off of uh, internet connected device is that you're most likely just to lose it. You know, you, yeah. it, you don't have a good backup solution. So what Ledger is trying to do is they're trying to offer a user-friendly backup solution. And of course right. the devil's in the details. The, the devil is indeed in the details. Um, so I, I would agree wholeheartedly here. Um, in fact, for most users, that is not kind of not even the second most likely way to lose your funds. It's the number one way to lose your funds is, is simply by misplacing uh, or not sufficiently guarding your seed. Um, the second most likely is probably phishing attacks uh, where you're basically socially engineered to give your seeds to someone uh, by being told you need to type it into a website or you need to provide it to a service because your account has been frozen. We've seen a lot of those social engineering attacks. Many people, even sophisticated users, have fallen for that. And kind of having your seed or your device stolen is so far down the list um, or your system hacked it's so far down the list of those risks that it doesn't even really matter unless you have unique circumstances that make you a highly targeted public figure. Um, you're not going to have someone attempt to steal your Bitcoin. Um, they're, they're just going to go for the easy marks and, and you're much more likely to lose it yourself. So uh, I understand the, the motivation for providing a recovery service and, um, and and just to clarify that that is kind of also what Casa does and it's one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk to you is because you have a lot of experience in providing exactly this kind of recovery um, service but you do it in a in a very different way so to me there are there are kind of three things that are um, a bit of a concern when it comes to how this service was built, how it was rolled out, and um, how it's kind of the details of how it's implemented from a risk um, model. But before we jump into that, already in 
the chat, I'm seeing people say things like, that's why I don't trust hardware wallets. You should use a paper wallet. Um, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere soon we're going to see, I built my own solution with Linux tails, a Raspberry Pi, and some epoxy glue, whatever. We're going to see a lot of those kind of reactions. And I want to be very clear before we go into any detail. A hardware wallet is the best and safest solution for the vast majority of users. 99.99% .99 of users still is. Um, building your own, doing a DIY solution using obsolete paper wallets, trying to do some weird encryption scheme using a USB stick, a custom Linux installation. All of those things are much, much more risky than simply buying and using a hardware wallet correctly. And, and the biggest risk with all of those solutions isn't that you're going to get your keys stolen, is that you're gonna make things so complicated that you will inadvertently exceed your own technical capability and lose uh, access to your own keys by accident, or you'll create a solution where you've, without really knowing what you've done, you've shifted the, the risk model so far into protecting the confidentiality of the keys, but you've degraded availability, availability being the ability to recover. And, and, and at that point, you don't notice that until you lose your seed. Um, yeah, you know, uh, one way that I try to break this down uh, is, uh, is actually a mantra that we see very often, safety in numbers. Now, you know, uh, virus in numerous, this is a motto that we see all the time. And people usually talk about it in terms of cryptography and the very large numbers that are, you know, used with private keys. But this actually applies in many different situations. And one of them is just your own security model, your own setup. If you have a novel setup, if, if it is a, a do-it-yourself thing where you know, you're, you're potentially making decisions and going down this logical path that few have ever tread before, it's far more likely that there are weaknesses in there that you've missed. Um, it's actually very similar to open source development. The more eyes that you have on something, the more likely it is the weaknesses will be found and addressed. And that's true, you know, that's true with all of these hardware manufacturers too. Look, Ledger is a huge company. They have a ton of money. I'm sure they have a ton of engineers. They have one of the most well-respected security teams out there. And you know, they have put a ton of resources into ensuring that their products are, are quite secure. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, one of the articles that did an analysis on Ledger's recover service mentions that in the entire existence of the Ledger company, which is almost uh, 10 years old, I think eight or nine years old now, um, they had sold 5 million devices before FTX. And then they sold another million devices just since FTX. Um, so, you know, that's, that's obviously a huge number of new users. So let's, let's talk about Recover in a bit more detail. Um, I'm going to throw out a few technical terms for our audience, whether you are into the technical terms or not. It, it, they won't be necessary to understand what we're talking about. First of all, um, how does Ledger split your seed? Uh, they do so using an industry standard algorithm called Shamir's Secret Sharing Scheme. And this is a, a one of the few actually um, mathematically provably secure cryptographic algorithms developed by uh, Shamir in the early 70s. So it's a, it's a very old concept. And it allows you to take any number and split it into... Uh, N independent shards of which you need K of those shards in a K of N scheme to recover it. So let's say you split it into three shards of which you need two. And you can, you can calibrate Shamir's to do three of five, four of 10, 26 of 1024 or whatever combination you want. Um, in this particular case, they're doing a two of three Shamir scheme uh, the algorithm is well understood, well known. Basically what the mathematical proof of Shamir's sharing scheme 
allows you to know is that having one shard is mathematically equivalent to having no shards, meaning you gain nothing from having only one of the n shards. Um, if you have essentially anything less than k, the quorum, the minimum number, which in this case is two, you have nothing. Um, it's not clear that what is transmitted from your ledger device is just the shard, though. Um, because for obvious reasons, they have to be able to identify which shard belongs to whom. And so when you sign up for this service, uh, these shards would have to be uh, attached somehow to you so that they can identify you in case of a recovery. The technical details don't really matter, but there must be some identifier there. And so very importantly here, and this is a nuance in the FAQ, the original device that did the split is not required for a recovery. Meaning that there's no secret encryption key or other identifier that is tied to the original device. You can lose the original device and they can recover to a new device using only the shards and your identity, which you prove to them by showing them a passport, um, doing a live video interaction, you know, probably waving your hand in front of your face to prove that you're not a deep fake AI um, and things like that, like we see nowadays. So what do we know? We know that this service allows you to split your seed into three components. All three components are sent out of your device over the internet to three different providers. These three providers have been identified as Ledger themselves, the company, um, a, a company in, uh, I believe the UK called CoinCover and a third company in the US called Escrow Tech. Um, each one of these companies will have only one of your shards. There's a bit more information in the, their newest post. They say they create an ephemeral encryption uh, key in order to transmit these. And I'm, I'm gonna take a guess here, but I'm guessing what they're doing is they have the public keys of uh, Ledger, CoinCover and escrow tech in the firmware of the device. And the ephemeral encryption key is created using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. That would probably be the most standard way of doing such a thing. Uh, again, these are robust, well-known um, encryption mechanisms. Uh, so then, okay, I mean, this sounds good. It's based on open, well-known cryptographic uh, algorithms. But right away, I have, three problems with the way this was rolled out. The first problem, and probably the most important problem, is this is being pushed to uh, Ledger Nano uh, X, I believe, or yeah, I S. think it's everything after the S. So my understanding That's is the Nano problem. S does not have sufficient memory to be able to perform the operations. Right, so this is being pushed out to all of the new Ledger devices, it's being put into the firmware whether or not you sign up for this service. So the capability to export, or some people might use the word exfiltrate if they want to be uh, meaner towards Ledger, exfiltrate your private key um, is being embedded in the firmware of every Ledger device the next time you update your firmware whether or not you choose to use this. So that's problem number one, and I will go into a lot more detail with that. Problem number two, um, because of the KYC requirements for recovery and the fact that the original device isn't used or needed to do a recovery, that means identifier, an identifier that connects this shard to your identity must be available to someone. And third, um, these three companies are located in uh, three countries 
uh, three different countries, the US, the UK, and France. Um, and they are entities subject to the jurisdiction and legal process of both national and international organizations. And therefore, they can be uh, coerced, uh, perhaps only slightly coerced, uh, to give a shard to law enforcement, given some process which you do not control, uh, which would then allow any law enforcement agency that can get two of these companies to give the shard to seize your money, freeze your money, um, reveal or find out how much money you have uh, stored on these devices. Uh, so these are the kind of the, the three big uh, problems I have with this, um, and, and we can look at them one by one. Do you see any other kind of really big concerns that people have brought up? Well, you know, I think a lot of the outrage, you know, was the fact that people have realized that uh, key exfiltration is is possible. And I mean, yeah. and, and this, is, this is, I think, generally a misunderstanding across the entire space of what the guarantees of these hardware devices actually are. Right. Uh, you know, you know, obviously, like the firmware of these devices can access the private key material. Uh, people just haven't understood that you're hoping, and 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 especially in in the case of Ledger being closed source, um, you, you're you're trusting that they simply do not make that functionality available. So you know, we can right. look at other devices, and we can literally look at the 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 APIs, the the programming interfaces that um, are made available to you know, developers such as myself when we want to interface with the device. And we can see there is no uh, way to make a call to that device to ask for the private keys. But that doesn't mean that you know, that functionality couldn't be added in the future. Well, there is now. Uh, in this particular case, there is a call to be made. Um, because if you sign up for Ledger Recover, you would obviously need to activate this. Now, there's a key point to mention here, which is that you would need to authorize it from the device. And Ledger is saying that this is equivalent to authorizing a signature from the device, and it requires the same level of trust the hardware manufacturer. Um, I disagree with that. I think the fact that there is code that takes the key, splits it into fragments and sends it to three different parties um, in the device means that the, the barrier to exfiltrating the keys is now I have to socially engineer the user to do that and somehow compromise those keys. But it now means that the code is in that device. And the real problem is that even if I haven't decided to participate in Ledger Recover, the code for it is now going to be pushed for my device if I connect it and allow it to do a firmware update. So I didn't opt into the service, but I am opting into the capability being installed on my device, which in my opinion makes it kind of a breach of the implicit relationship between me and the manufacturer of this device that I used to decide to buy it. I bought this to do cold storage and self-custody. I didn't buy this to do hybrid custody and I didn't consent to that. So I did trust the manufacturer, of course. I had to trust the manufacturer, but I trusted the manufacturer based on, among other things, assurances they made that you cannot ever take the private keys off the device. And now they've actually put code in there that does exactly that. So um, I have a problem with that. Now, before people kind of jump to conclusions and start running around, I, I think it's important to mention a couple of things. One, there will be a large number of phishing attacks in the immediate aftermath of the controversy that surrounded this, that will attempt to persuade you that in order to not have this feature, 
you need to get this other firmware or you need to put your seed into this other website. And in reality, people acting rashly, quickly, with speed, panic, and um, uh, kind of with a need to do something quickly is often the way that people lose money. So my first advice would be, if you have money on a ledger that has not been connected and had its hardware, its firmware updated, or it's an older model like the S, you don't need to do anything. Right now, you don't need to do anything. Even if you have a ledger that's on the newer firmware and maybe has even had that firmware installed on it, you still don't need to do anything right now but you might want to think carefully about whether you connect that ledger back to anything and do a transaction. Because the next time you connect it, you're going to get the firmware updated and you now have a new capability in there, which may not be on, but it's in. <laughs> and, and that's a problem, at least in my mind. And... Um, that means you can also be socially engineered potentially to participate in this scheme without your knowledge. So, so first of all, don't do anything. The, the fundamental security model of hardware models hasn't, hasn't changed, of hardware wallets hasn't changed. Um, a ledger that you have and you've stored securely where you have a good backup of your seat continues to mean, it continues to be a, a perfectly suitable device for cold storage. You shouldn't be doing frequent transactions on that device anyway. Um, I don't use a ledger for cold storage. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, I do use a ledger for my operating account uh, for things like my, my store and little expenses for my staff. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to continue using it for that because even if the system is completely compromised, the loss is, is small. Um, so, so that's number one, right? Uh, number, uh, would you agree with that assessment, Jameson? Or do you have a different take on it? Yeah, I mean, we, we're not advising anyone that, you know, this is an emergency where you need to you know, stop what you're doing because, you know, keys are at risk immediately. But, um, you know, as you know, we've been providing integrations with a variety of different manufacturers over the years and like firmware upgrades are just like a part of life. Yeah. And this, this is another interesting point to get into, you know, the sort of open source versus closed source nature of it is that especially any closed source devices, um, they could be giving you firmware updates and, and they could be providing, you know, key exfiltration functionality in those updates and not telling you about it. So, right. you know, you, you do at least have to get let, let Ledger some uh, props for being open about the fact that this is now being added. You know, they're not trying to hide it. Obviously, the, the, the PR disaster is, is due to, um, you know, people feeling like the, there have been certain uh, trusts uh, and assumptions that have been broken as a result of it. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, we've got a few questions here. Someone says, what happens if people don't update firmware and you don't use it with Ledger Live, you use it with a third party program. You can use it with MetaMask, you can use it with Electrum for Bitcoin, you can use it with uh, any number. There's like probably 30 different software front ends for Bitcoin and 30 more for Ethereum and other chains that have hardware wallet interfaces that you can plug your Ledger into. You don't need to use their software. Um, and, and in some cases, in some scenarios, I certainly have found other pieces of software have better things for managing fees and um, are more up to date on some of the other features you might care about. So one of the key concepts of a hardware wallet that you should always consider is that the companion software uh, is not necessary um, for you to be able to use that device. And, and sometimes the companion software isn't right for your needs. Here's the caveat, and this is something that's going to become an issue. Um, and it's the same thing with when, for example, you have a fork in a chain. 
Um, if you refuse to do the update, your software uh, is, or your firmware in the case of a hardware wallet is now in a state of decay. Uh, and that decay occurs because the technology moves forward um, vulnerabilities are found, bugs are found, little errors, inconveniences, perhaps not critical bugs, but still annoying bugs, the overpay fees, for example, or other things like that. And so the longer you leave that device without upgrading the firmware, the less useful it becomes over time. There's a very good chance that you will still be able to access your Bitcoin, your Ether, etc. Uh, but maybe some other more obscure chain uh, is deprecated. Uh, a new one is added that you haven't been able to use. The fee management scenarios have changed. Uh, new protocols for addresses are introduced. So you'll still be able to use it, but it might not be fresh. So, so one of the big considerations here is if you let your ledger sit and rot, um, and refuse to do firmware updates, effectively you're saying um, that you've given up on that device. Maybe it's better to consider a new device if you've reached that point in your risk analysis. I mean, there's also a software dependency issue. Uh, it's, it's hard to put uh, an exact time frame on it, but you know, whatever that companion wallet software you're using is having to use a uh, software libraries to allow you to interface with the hardware device. Yeah. And so generally uh, over a long enough period of time, uh, they, they may upgrade the libraries that they're using and in fact break the compatibility with whatever your old firmware version is. Yep. Uh, and I, I, you say it's hard to put a time frame on that. I found that after three or four years, it, it starts getting tricky. So I've had situations where I tried to use an old hardware device, not just Ledger, um, others too. And um, the device drivers, the operating system infrastructure, the libraries, the Python libraries, the whatever else I need um, to use that has all changed and maybe it doesn't support that old farmer version. So that, that's a problem. Um, all right, so the, the, the other um, so, so people who have ledgers, who bought ledgers before this was available, who do not intend to use the recovery feature, are now facing a rather awkward kind of dilemma or conundrum. Do I still use this device, knowing that they might add some unnecessary uh, features, which slightly maybe increase my risk? Maybe they, it doesn't. We don't know. We, we can't know. And, or do I um, switch to a new device? And first of all, I would say there's no urgency here. So I would say that if you do decide to switch to another device, don't try to rush this process very carefully. Um, get a new device, get familiar with it, set up a new seed, uh, figure out all of the mechanics, test it, back it up, restore it, wipe it, restore it again, make sure everything's working, send a small test amount, send it back out after wiping it. And once you're very, very comfortable, maybe then you should move your money off that seed. Um, I would certainly do that from my perspective and I take my time uh, doing that. Uh, if you decide you want to use the, the Ledger Recover service, um, you should know the risks that come with that. And I think the risks that Ledger is most underplaying are the, the risks of, uh, of a, a government-imposed seizure or freezing of these things. They've basically de-decentralized this. Uh, they've taken a self-custody solution, and if you use Recover, it's essentially a hybrid custody solution, if not a custodial solution. And those custodians can be coerced to seize um, your money or reveal how much money you have. Um, we also don't know what the social engineering risk is. I guess we don't know exactly what the authentication procedures uh, will be if you are a ledger recover user and how an attacker might be able to pretend to be you and you know, convince them to basically let, let an attacker reconstitute your private keys. Yes. Um, 
back in the day, um, I I tried to build a company to to help do this kind of recovery. Uh, we called it Third Key Recovery Solutions or Third Key Solutions, and what I found was the 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 inflection point was you can either do this at very high levels of security and uh, authentication, or you can do it at scale, but not both. Uh, Ledger is saying you can do up to three changes a month and no more than 10, up to three recoveries a month and no more than 10 per year per user. They have 6 million users. If this has any uptake whatsoever, um, the actual standards they're going to have to use for identifying users are going to have to be fairly soft. And the other thing I'm thinking about is they've talked about how the shards are stored in hardware security mod modules by the three escrow companies. Um, that and generally again, means internet connected. <laughs> that means internet connected HSMs that are API driven. It doesn't mean um, HSMs that are, um, that are um, air gapped with uh, further fragmentation of the private keys to access the HSMs and um, multi-user, multi-factor, you know, insert three cards for many of the five executives, because that doesn't scale for operational reasons. And, um, it, and to add another concern, all of this is happening just when the ability for AI to deepfake voice and video has gotten so incredibly sophisticated. Um, so again, uh, this is one of those difficult situations where I don't know if they can do this at scale without sacrificing um, security. I do know hum someone who can do this at scale, and that's the US government in um, un unmasking, seizing, and freezing uh, assets of, of people all around the world. They can do that at scale. And so that's the other big concern I have. The UK, the US, and France are not three wholly independent countries. Uh, they're all members of the Five Eyes surveillance uh, network. Um, they're very strong uh, military partners. They collaborate on a number of law enforcement things. Two of them are in Europol. Um, one of them um, controls international <laughs> law enforcement in many ways. And, um, you know, uh, the irony that struck me is one of the reasons I got into Bitcoin and one of the things that, that was mon uh, like monumental, instrumental in my initial adoption and interest in the technology was this started with WikiLeaks trying to fundraise while Julian Assange was being accused of treason um, for revealing the war crimes of the British and American government. And guess what? The US and the UK are collaborating very closely um, to punish a journalist who told the world about their war crimes. Uh, and Assange is, is the victim of that close collaboration. So two of the three shards being in the UK and the US, they might as well be in the same place, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that yeah, does not you know, fill me with confidence. Yeah, and and we can talk about you know, obviously the technical details all day all day long, but I think another w easy way to uh, give people an idea of really what the the security, even from Ledger's perspective of this particular feature, is, um, I believe in their documentation they were suggesting that you not do it for more than fifty thousand dollars worth of uh, of money. That's the that's the insurance provided by one of their partners, CoinCover, um, so that if something goes wrong and you lose your money because of this, they cover you up to fifty thousand. Um, again, so okay, so maybe this is really targeted for um, operational wallets and uh, the vast amount. You know, fifty thousand is a lot of money. Um, for the vast majority of the six million people who have uh ledger devices i would guess that 90 percent of them have less than fifty thousand uh on those devices um so maybe it's uh suitable um so it, you have to think about this from your own risk management perspective um are you comfortable with a hybrid custody solution that is not exactly as custodial as a single exchange um 
it's uh, not exactly as um, uh, self-sovereign as uh, a much more decentralized solution. Um, and, you know, the one your company provides as an example of that. Um, and so you have to kind of balance these risks out. I don't think there's any reason to, to uh, worry about that unless you want to take advantage of that service. So the, the final kind of thing that, that comes out of this is how this was all rolled out. Um, I, I don't know what the hell is happening at Ledger, but you, when you're dealing with a community that is as careful, some would say paranoid, uh, certainly tuned in and ready to jump and worried about geopolitics as the community in the cryptocurrency space is, um, you don't design and deliver a feature like this with very little independent audit, with very little independent oversight, with uh, a, 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 a modicum of uh, half-veiled answers, and then let PR manage the ensuing crisis. Um, this is another example, I think, of Ledger being really tone deaf uh, to this uh, community and its concerns. Yeah, I mean, my take was that, you know, they, they, they probably had plenty of, of internal meetings and, you know, they were running some numbers and they were saying, like you were saying, you know, probably not, the vast majority of our users have under 50,000 and this, this will help a lot of them, uh, you know, not, not lose their keys. And I think they were probably just focused on the, the, the market segment that they're targeting here. And, and yeah. it seems like they just forgot about the other, the rest of the market that is not interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, didn't learn from past uh, experiences of very badly managing the aftermath of a botched uh, situation as happened with the leak of their database. Um, so I don't use, I, I mentioned before, I don't use a ledger for uh, cold storage. Um, I use it for an operational account only, and maybe that's exactly their target market. Um, if you are using a ledger for cold storage and you want to switch to another solution, as I mentioned before, I would start with a fresh seed. It doesn't have to be 24 words, as someone said in the chat, 12 is enough. Um, and, and, and this is because the, the fundamental security of the elliptic curves uh, is, is really 128 bits. So uh, 12 words is enough um, and is easier to not lose uh, and back up. And, but you must test it. The way I test it is I create, uh, generate the new seed. I back it up on a durable uh, medium. Uh, steel is my preferred solution. I think I have, actually I have one of the devices I use here. Let's see. Um, this I've shown it to you before. It's a crypto steel capsule. I'm sure you know this one, uh, Jameson. And and what it is is a series of uh, stamped discs that have uh, letters on them that go around a rod. And inside the steel tube, the whole thing is stainless steel, uh, impervious to fire, corrosion, uh, floods, whatever. Great, that solves it. I then wipe the device, or I send a dollar to it. Then I wipe it, and then I recover from that, from the, from the actual thing that I'm going to recover. So I'm training and recreating the exact circumstances of a zero basis recovery, where I start from the only backup that I have left to me, which is the stamped steel, all the way back, and then try to send that dollar back to myself and execute a signature and transaction. Once I've done that, I know that I have a complete operational cycle for that device. Now, obviously, that's a one copy. Uh, you would probably want two copies um, of your seed. And then if you want to get into more complicated things, there's a number of other um, options. For Bitcoin, I'll tell you my recommendation. Uh, for Bitcoin-only solutions, I use a cold card. Um, 
uh, again, I happen to have my the Velcro ripping you here is the um, our, is the uh, Faraday bag they're in. Um, so this is a cold card. Uh, it's a transparent case. You can actually see all of the hardware inside. Uh, this is a Bitcoin only cold storage device. It's completely air gapped. You use an SD card in the side uh, to move stuff from one device to another. Um, there are a number of other hardware wallets you can use. I'm not gonna show you the rest. Um, for if you want to do multi-currency, uh, uh, there are the wallets uh, that are available to you. Um, I quite like the, the Trezor, which is the original hardware wallet that I bought. Uh, they're obviously a direct competitor uh, to Ledger. And I would say that at least, I don't wanna say they've done a better job because I think Jameson, you were very gracious in saying that they think of the market that they're addressing. And that market is low value, not cold, cold storage, not particularly paranoid about government action and more interested in an investment vehicle and adoption of this. And for that market, maybe this is the right answer. I can tell you one thing, uh, the people who make Trezor were never going after that market. Uh, and um, they make decisions that indicate that. One of the things that I find disappointing here is the way that these decisions were made by Ledger. Um, and uh, I, I wish they had uh, better ways of communicating. Uh, no hardware wallet is, is perfect. Someone else pointing out Trezor has issues too. Um, they're partnering with a company that supports uh, censorship. Uh, I would take that with a grain of salt, but every company has issues. Companies are entities. They're subject to various jurisdictional environments. Um, they have decisions made by fallible humans, every company. But I will say that, and going back to how we started this, a hardware wallet is still better than the DIY solution that you carve your own path through the jungle and hope that it's uh, a good path um, and is much less likely to cause you to lose money. All right, I think we've covered a lot of things. Let's see if there are any uh, final questions on the chat and then uh, maybe Jameson, maybe you have some additional thoughts to, to wrap up on. Yeah, you know, um, you know, CASA, you know, my company has been focused on the super extreme cold storage solutions and, and we're able to do that because these hardware companies don't necessarily target the same market. Um, you know, like you said, there's trade-offs with everything. There's, um, you can go to the extreme with any of the, the decisions that you're making uh, when like trying to architect your setup. And, and that's what we try to do is help people think of absolutely everything that can go wrong. Because yeah. you know, let's be honest that you know, regardless of if you're using cold card, Trezor, Ledger, Bitbox, whatever, uh, those are still, you know, physical single points of failure, right? You don't yeah. have redundancy. You, you kind of touched on it a little bit with some of like the seed backup problems that like, uh, if you really want to have robust redundant seed backups, then you actually need to do like some splitting of the seeds. Maybe you want to do yeah. a seed zor of your seeds. And we start going down these rabbit holes that, you know, we could spend the rest of the day talking about. Yeah. And, and um, one of the challenges there is that, for people who are experts who are designing possible solutions for different levels of risk, um, these kinds of uh, decisions about, uh, should I split? Should I use a passphrase? Should I do more than just the basics? Um, are very carefully balanced. Uh, and they're balanced across multiple concerns and multiple th um, possible threats. When let me put it this way, when amateurs do this, when non-professional, people who haven't been trained, don't have experience in information security, try to do this, one of the difficulties is there's two hidden variables that they often overlook in their assessment. The first one is violating the keep it simple, uh, stupid rule, the KISS rule of security, which is security that is simple to execute, simple to operate, um, uh, is is usually going to 
be more successful than overly complex things. And the problem is that keeping it simple is relative to your own technical expertise and the technical expertise of the people who will clean up after you when you're run over by a bus, the family that you hope to leave your oodles of Bitcoin to. Um, between those two principles, a lot of people make a very um, obvious and bad mistake, which is they make something too complex. It either exceeds their technical ability to, to operate it consistently, and then they lose their keys by accident, or it certainly exceeds the technical ability of their heirs to operate. And because it's a path no one has gone down before, or it hasn't been sufficiently documented, uh, no one can figure where the treasure is buried. Um, so the reason why um, a treasure hunting stories is so uh, appealing in popular culture is because people violated the KISS rule and buried their treasure through layers and layers and layers of obfuscation. The Da Vinci Code would be a very boring movie if someone had a, a well-developed operational security manual that they'd left behind, right? Um, so, so one is that, and the other one is the, the other hidden variable that will bite you in the ass is that while you can see all of the things you're doing to make it harder for someone to steal your money, you're not seeing all of the compromises you're making in the overall availability and recoverability because you don't exercise recoveries often enough. And so an amateur will make something very hard to steal at the expense without realizing that this is a trade-off of making it recoverable and then will lose the seeds themselves and not be able to recover it. So be very careful. Generally, I recommend people do not do um, DIY uh, solutions, uh, Glacier Protocol, paper wallets, et cetera, et cetera. There is one nuance here uh, and a question from the chat that I want to ask and answer. Jeremy asks, what if there was a passphrase on the seed phrase with a ledger? Would that be sharded off also or would that be on the end user to keep safe? There's no clarity in the documentation of Ledger, so I'm going to, I'm going to make a guess here. The Ledger says specifically that what they shard is your pre-BIP39 seed, uh, meaning essentially the, the random number that the, the seed is built from, right? That the words are built from. The passphrase isn't added until after BIP39, uh, converts the number into words. And therefore the passphrase by all documentation that I've seen, and again, the documentation is lacking, is not backed up. Meaning that if you have a passphrase, uh, you still need that to recover. And absent that, you cannot do a recovery. Here's the little problem though. And I think this is important to understand. That's actually not a security benefit. That's a recovery disability. Because if you forget your passphrase, it will be very difficult for you to recover. But if I don't have your passphrase and all I'm trying to do is crack your passphrase because I have the seed, it is not impossible. So let's talk about that very briefly to explain it. There was a really, and I'll go a bit technical for those who are interested. There was a very interesting compromise made in the specification of BIP39, given the hardware capabilities of the device that it was going to run on. And that was to use only 2000 rounds of the key stretching algorithm PBK DF2 in the use of the passphrase. That means if you're trying to brute force this, you have to pick a passphrase, guess a passphrase, and then you have to run that passphrase through 2,000 rounds of a hash stretching algorithm. And then you can test to see if those addresses have money in them. That takes time. But because this was designed to run on a little device this big, which was a, a very simple 32-bit processor with not much RAM, um, they limited it to 2,000 rounds. Uh, I want to give you a bit of a reference for that. 
uh, modern day password managers like Bitwarden or LastPass that you use for that um, are now recommending a minimum number of rounds set to 100,000 rounds, not 2,000, so 50 times more. And many sophisticated users will uh, set it to a minimum of 500,000 or a million rounds because on my laptop, on my iPad, on my Android phone, running a million rounds of the password stretching out algorithm still only takes about half a second to a second. If you are a determined attacker who has um, a couple thousand machines in a warehouse or data center running with GPU acceleration, or you have the money to rent that on demand or spot pricing from Amazon, um, you can brute force uh, a, a short passphrase uh, with 2000 rounds effectively. It may take you a month, but you can do that. And the problem is there, you're running into this very difficult balance, which is if you make your passphrase too long, once again, you just traded confidentiality for availability. You're much more likely to fuck up the recovery and never be able to get back to your money because you made your passphrase too long and complex and didn't back it up. Um, and it still won't thwart a determined adversary. For example, our, our friends at the National Storage Agency um, from being able to brute force that trivially with the hardware that they have. So, so that's a, to give you, so that's not really the saving grace that you think it is um, for the security model. Yeah, I mean, I'll say anecdotally, uh, I think pretty much anyone who has worked in the self-custody space, uh, we've seen a lot of people just lock themselves out of their money because they put a passphrase on it and, and forgot it. Um, it might also be worth noting, though, that, uh, you know, this type of like Shamir secret sharing uh, of the backup key, it's actually something that's possible for people to do themselves uh, yes. if you have a treasure. Uh, tre um, I, I guess I don't think you went into it too much, but Shamir secret sharing can be a little tricky if you're implementing, if you're running your own implementation of it. There have yes. been a number of, of times out there where software implemented it and, and they accidentally had weaknesses. But Trezor's uh, Shamir secret sharing is their own, uh, it's not a Bitcoin improvement, it's a, a, you know, a slip, a Satoshi it's Labs a Satoshi improvement Labs. proposal. Yes, slip yeah, 30 but, specifically if uh, our mods could link that in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's well vetted and you know, that is something that I would uh, feel safe recommending for people to do if you wanted to go down that path. Yeah, and so I recommend if you have a seed and you want to make sure that your seed is both more available because you have more than one copy, but more also um, less easy to steal, the, the correct answer to do it is not to come up with your own scheme, but to use something like Slip to break it into a two or three shard situation, store those three shards securely. And even if someone gets those shards, um, they can't easily, um, uh, they have to get to two of those shards in order to be able to break in. Uh, by the way, the other thing is silly, but very simple security mechanisms that people forget about. When, when, when you store, uh, let's say you steal backup, and let's say you do your steal backup um, for your three shards, of which two are required for recovery. Um, when I store shards, um, or seeds that are sensitive, that I have money on. And I really want to know if someone's ever been able to access that. Uh, this looks fairly dumb and simple, but you can get a uh, hundred of these bags from Amazon. Uh, these are tamper evident bags. Uh, these ones are from, um, M well, there we go, MMF Industries. Um, they sell these for churches uh, so they can collect cash um, without uh, all of the uh, godly people stealing the cash um, because uh, trust in God, but trust in MMF industries more. And, <laughs> and what this is, is a bag that um, once you seal, uh, the seal here is um, heat proof, cold proof, crack proof, tear proof, uh, and it cannot be opened without distorting it, without leaving evidence that you opened it. So you take your steel back up, 
you pop it in the bag. You sign on the outside of the bag so that you can recognize your own signature and you record the serial number, which is unique over there. You seal the bag, you put it in a safe. And now you, you know if someone's been at your seed and you need to do something, for example, protect the other two shards or move your money or something like that. So that's another uh, little bit of advice. And all of this ties into a bigger question, which LuxBlocks just asked, which is what is the best plan to the best way to plan succession in case I die? I don't want my family to have the access to the wallets when I'm still alive. You want them to have, as, they, as we say in the industry, you want them to have access to your money uh, after you die and not a minute before. <laughs> Yeah, too bad that that usually runs into the Oracle problem, though, you know, there's some improvements in Bitcoin scripting, I think, that will make inheritance uh, more feasible. Yeah, um, the, the problem with this is, is, is more often not technology, but people. Um, your cousin Charlie, who is a lovely person now, uh, but is a meth addict six months from now, um, is the one who's going to get you. Uh, and, and, and that's where the problem lies. For advice on that, um, we, uh, one of the people I've worked with in the past is Pamela Morgan, who wrote the Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning for, for Owners. Uh, and that's a book that looks at the technical, legal, and operational or people aspects of this problem, because it's a three-dimensional problem. Uh, there's people issues, there's technical issues, and there's also legal issues um, where you need to make sure that what you did is also compatible so that uh, your heirs don't end up suing each other and giving all of the money to the lawyers. So um, have we beaten this dead horse enough, Jameson? Yeah, I mean, I think we hit uh, the, the high level points, you know, it's it's not a, a super emergency, but, um, you know, I think it's another good forcing function just to get people to think more carefully about exactly uh, what their security model is. You know, uh, it's very easy to make assumptions about your security model, especially if you're not a, an expert. Yep, and um, uh, one piece of advice that uh, I try to follow myself and I give to others is review your security, your backups, your password storage, uh, your safe, your important documents, your wills um, once a year. I usually spend uh, the day after uh, New Year's Day um, doing exactly that, or at least within the first week of the year, I do a comprehensive review of all of those things, make sure I know where my seeds are, um, what devices I have, if I've opened any new accounts that I didn't do last time, if my passwords are secure, if my family is informed, if I have my will updated, all of those little things that we leave because life gets too busy. All right, I think that's a, a, a great point. Um, uh, and PM Mod says CASA is another option. They work with people to create inheritance planning. I know that's one of the uh, service offerings you have for inheritance planning. Yeah, I mean, the short version is, uh, you know, when you're paying for CASA, yeah, you're getting software and stuff, but a lot of it and a lot of the heavy lifting, you're, you're really paying for consultation. And, yeah. and it's because, as should be obvious from anyone who's you, you heard the complexity of some of the stuff we've talked about today, uh, these can be very personal and individual problems and people have different needs. And so it's very, uh, it's very difficult, you know, even for experts to be talking about um, these issues because in many cases we have to, you have to be a little hand wavy of like, well, there's a whole plethora of different options and we cannot prescribe one specific option that will broadly apply for everyone and everyone's needs. Just like we, I'm, I can't go and say, you know, everyone should use this one hardware manufacturer. Um, it's because th they all have different strengths and weaknesses and, yeah. uh, and it's important just for people to uh, evaluate their own needs and, and evaluate what uh, the, the possibilities are. Yeah, and I, I, I think uh, to, to people's great relief, the security models that you and I have to run are very, very different from those that most people have to run. <laughs> and they're lucky um, in that way, but, uh, but still distinct. All right. Um, Jameson, thank you so much. I know this was last minute and you're at a conference. I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, Miami. I really appreciate you contributing to this conversation today. Glad to be here as always.
All right. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye, everyone.